We're very happy to have Rob Sherwood this afternoon. He's going to tell us everything we need to know about our rigs, which ones we ought to have, and which ones can go out on the flea market table next year. <laughs> well, the good thing is there are so many good radios today that I'm now going to be part of this presentation talking about the next thing we need to improve are the transmitters because the, the receivers are now through the stratosphere of you, any of the five major brands. So, so uh, let's talk about you know, really being on the air uh, in a pileup, a contest, or whatever it is. We want to hear the weak signals, of course, because those are the ones that we need. Uh, there's going to be strong stations all around, and we hopefully can pick out the weak sig signals. And uh, on CW, you know, D-Expedition with... Thank goodness they run split because somebody's always going to be transmitting when the DX guy is transmitting. So if we're up a few kilohertz, that's an advantage. I just wish they'd spread out the uh, signals on CW like they do on sideband. They'll say, you know, up 5 to 10 or 15 or whatever. But on CW, they just tend to say up 2. And you look at on your waterfall or your spectrum scope and your, you know, 100 stations right on top of each other. So I wish they'd spread out more. And uh, you need a better receiver for CW than sideband, and I'll cover that. And uh, like I say, the weak point is if you've got maybe the top 18 transceivers, I'll show you that uh, they're so good that we really need to be looking at transmitters and amplifiers improving over the next few years. So if you read QST, of course, they're going to you're look at charts, and you're going to see graphs, and uh, you know the magic. We want this 100 dB radio, and of course that's great. Well, there's now several radios, a good number, that are dynamic range, and I'll explain that in a moment, what that means for sure. It's better than 100. And uh, reciprocal mixing, well, that's kind of a new term since 2012 or 13, and the ARRL defined that. That's phase noise. Back when synthesized radios came out 20, 25 years ago, phase noise was pretty bad. Before that, with our Collins that was up here yesterday, or a Drake that we saw, a whole bunch of Drakes, we had a crystal oscillator for the band and a PTO. And those really didn't have much noise. So noise was not much of an issue. Dynamic range were not really high, you know, maybe in the 80s, but phase noise was not an issue. Then phase noise, then synthesized radios came along. We didn't have drift anymore, but guess what? We got rid of the grif drift and we got phase noise. So he here we can look at this. Let's just make a cutoff because that was sort of the magic numbers off, off my uh, website. If we pick 96 dB radios or better, look how many there are. We've got the, uh, the expensive uh, ICOM. We've got all the flex models that since the, the 6000 series came out at K3S. If you've got a K3, spend your $250 and get the new synthesizer. It makes a big difference. And then the $1,000, $7,300. I mean, what do you want for $1,000? It's an amazing radio. I've run a lot of contests with that. And then the big brother, the 7610. At Dayton... Uh, a year ago, more, uh, we had two new radios announced from uh, Kenwood and Yezu. And uh, the, in the case of the uh, Kenwood, it shipped by last October. The, the new Yezu just shipped after Dayton. It just shipped, uh, well, just in time for Dayton. So we didn't get to use that in a contest. And then the Apache line, I haven't tested the 8,000, but I have used the 7,000 on the air before that to 2,000. So we just have an amazing number of radios today that are going to do the job. You just have to pick what you want. So as I mentioned, the two new radios that were uh, announced it, uh, a year ago were the Kenwood, and it's a hybrid architecture. What's that mean? That's a, a regular super hit, like we just saw in our little display there, that you know you got a mixer, you got your you know, double conversion or whatever it is. But then the waterfall and the spectrum scope were direct sampling. So if, for instance, if you looked at the TS-990 that came out about five or six years ago, and I had one for three years until a lightning bolt took it out. Um, it didn't hit it direct, but it was just an you know, electromagnetic pulse. Uh, the, the spectrum scope is drastically better, and so you can just see fine detail that you couldn't see in a swept uh, analyzer that was in the 990. Or if you go clear back to the ICOM 781, and I owned those for several years, uh, that was a swept analyzer, but now, boy, the scopes are just amazing. So I got to start using the uh, Kenwood and CQ Worldwide uh, of October of last year, and then the, the FTDX 1001. That just shipped end of April. Uh, so I got to borrow one from another ham. 
got to look at it in the lab, but I never did get to use it on the air. So it just, it missed the entire DX uh, contest season and all that. So the 990 was a good radio. It was dual receive, um, but its phase noise was its weak point. And it was kind of a case where back several years ago, the league tested things in a way that they just kind of ignored phase noise. And so Kenwood kind of missed that. And then they, I got to test it and got to use it and I actually bought one. And uh, it was fine at wider spacings of five or 10 kilohertz, but it, it really had a weak point in a pileup. Um, so it's, it's, well, that's only weak point of the 990 was the phase noise. So the 890 came along and they just did it in spades. They did it perfectly. So it actually has the best phase noise I've ever measured in a rig, including the new Yezu that's just a few dB behind. So that's where we really uh, saw the big improvement. But we only have a signal receiver, not dual, but most of the time that's plenty. I think in CQ Worldwide, I work one station on 40 meter sideband that was running split. Usually I work a half a dozen, you know, they're down below 70, uh, below, you know, like 7150 or something like that, or 7100, and, uh, you know, listening up above 72. But um, so that time I just, uh, I hardly needed the second uh, receiver. But it was so good, I actually had to buy some really low noise crystal oscillators. I happened to pick Wenzel. I got bought them on eBay for like 50 bucks a piece. You know, one near 40 meters, one really close to 20 and on. So to get the accurate measurements, it took better than we'd see signals on the air. So, but we wanted the numbers to be accurate. So if you have any questions or you raise your hand and say, what did he say? Uh, we, we've had good back and forth here this, yesterday. Uh, if you've got a question, just wave your hand or stand up and yell at me. So if something doesn't make any sense. So here's a comparison between the 990 that came out about six or so years ago and this new 890. Well, actually, the dynamic range wide spaced the 20 kilohertz that we saw in QST for like, well, since 1975, actually. Um, the 990 actually slightly ahead, but we're talking about numbers over 100. But you see there at 2 kilohertz, the 890 is so much better than the, uh, the uh, 990, but that's because of phase noise. That isn't a true third order measurement. That's just a noise measurement. So if we look at the RMDR, reciprocal mixing dynamic range, that's how the league defined a new way to talk about phase noise. But look at it, 20 kilohertz, one's over 130, the other's 116, and at two kilohertz closed in, 89 versus 127. So if you were in a pileup and you uh, had a station really close by that was really strong, that would be, that would really uh, you know, separate the, uh, the older technology and the new. Be interesting to see if we ever get a 990 SG. You know, we had the 590S and then the 590 SG. I talked to uh, Phil Parton, who's the sales manager for uh, for uh, Kenwood, and he said, "We well, that may happen down the road, but right now there'll be other new things coming out, so that's not a big priority at the moment." But the uh, the 890 is just a great radio from that standpoint. W2KRY, he loaned me his, not, not, his 101, his, Ken, his uh, Yezu FTDX 101D. So I had it for several weeks and uh, ran it through the lab and then found some problems, contacted uh, Yezu, other people found the problems. It was tripping out the amplifiers. It was having ALC overshoot that was really bad. Uh, you could set it for 30 or 40 watts, a lot of amps today, particularly the solid state, they only take 30 or 40 watts. You could say CQ and it put out 180 watts instead of 30 or 40 watts. That's a good way to blow up amplifiers. <laughs> so suddenly uh, Yezu had to do a recall. Everything in dealer stock like a DX Engineering, HRO, they all had to go to California. They shipped me a, a, a prepaid shipping label, the one that I had from Randy. Uh, it went back to California. It was there for about 10 days or two weeks, came back, got to test it again, virtually fixed. I mean, nothing like the before, but uh, you could still get a little overshoot on side band, but nothing enough to either trip out an uh, amplifier or to damage something. So you wonder, how did that get through? I mean, do you guys remember when the uh, ICOM and the, well, the 590S from Kenwood and the, let's see, the 70, 7410, they had some overshoot troubles. They were mentioned in QST reviews, and those got recalls. And this was several years ago. So you just kind of wonder, well, how did that get by? But it did. 
how many of you were at Dayton this year? Did you happen to go by the Ellicraft booth? And of course, the K-4 was announced. How many years have we been waiting for a K-4? Uh, and the K-3 came out, I believe, in 2008. And uh, of course, there's been incremental improvements, and it's kind of a modular radio. And uh, so, like I say, you could put in the new synthesizer. There were all sorts of changes over time. Um, my guess is that once the 7300 came out a little over two years ago, that was kind of a game changer. Uh, it was mentioned last night that uh, uh, some people, uh, other OEMs said, well, it's not a perfect radio, but wow, for $1,000, it's an amazing radio. Well, suddenly everyone sort of had to kind of wake up and, uh, and uh, see what's uh, changing. So the new Elecraft is kind of like if you just buy the base unit, which will be like $4,000, it's like the 7610. It'll be a dual receive direct sampling radio, I'll explain that. And, uh, but if you need the high blocking numbers of a K3 or K3S, then you buy a, an option for, I don't know, $700 or something, and you can get the K3 type of performance if you're like field day, you got a ham a mile away or something like that. So then uh, you can, it would be more like the new Yezu, the 101D, because it is uh, a super hit and with the direct sampling scope. So it's going to be interesting to see the product out of the Elecraft. It'll ship maybe December if you've paid money up front. Um, but, you know, next year it will be, I'm sure they'll be available in quantity. Of course, no one knows anything about it other than we got to see it play. So here's a couple of rigs that I used. Uh, it's ever since I've been out at my station uh, East of Fort Collins, I've got 10 acres out there and six towers and nine HF Yagis and some wire antennas. I really enjoyed all these radios that come through that get, I borrow them from people. I certainly can't own every radio. And um, so I get to use them on the air in contests. And some of uh, my musings on that, are, uh, at the last slide of this, you can see a link. And if anybody wants a PDF of this, because the links will be a little hard to remember, uh, I go over using these radios in contests and how they compare. So you usually use two at a time, and so that's sort of fun. So I got to use the, uh, the new Kenwood at CQ Worldwide a sideband. And of course, that's maybe the most popular contest there is as far as a participation worldwide. But it's not really going to be a great test for how good the radio is because on sideband, adjacent channel splatter, intermod products, are really kind of the limit, and I'll show you that in a bit. But so for a CW contest is a better way to say, okay, does this radio really be able to handle a pileup? So the two AWRL contests in December of last year, the 160 meter CW, I've been operating that for years. The 10 meter contest, it's mixed mode. You can either enter mixed mode or one or the other, but as you know, 10 meters hasn't been up to par lately. Not like it's you know like five years ago. So spent a lot of time on CW weak signals. So it was a good way to say uh, not only does it uh, we can pick out weak signals close to each other, but we can w work those weak signals. I would say between the uh, 7610 and the TS 890 that the DSP is fine. The selectivity is great. Uh, audio peak filter. If you work in CW. The audio peak filter is nice, even if it's not so much to reduce computer RAM, it just takes the edge off the noise. It, it's it, it's you know, audio bandpass filter in effect. So I'd say the ICOM wins on those, but the, the, the waterfall for the Kenwood is something special. And actually, that's why I choose to actually own that radio. I've got a 7610 and the 890 that are in operating position one and operating position two. So I'll show you what that these, uh, this new band scope works like. And it's the key is when you're tuning. Okay, um, when you're tuning, most of the time, um, the, the, you get a skew pattern. I'll just show you the next slide to explain this better. Th this is the ICOM, and it was, the contest was over at this point, so I just wanted to demonstrate that when you would tune the radio, the waterfall slews, or it skews. And you can see that I tuned it about two kilohertz, and you got that big diagonal line in there. So when you're trying to use the waterfall to pick the next station to work, but you're tuning it, it, uh, it smears. And then the other thing is, often you want to run some, some uh, averaging so that the noise is a little bit less. 
And then look at that little tiny blip over in the right that you can barely see. Well, if I've got averaging on and I tune the radio, well, that signal is going to disappear for two or three seconds. And then it, it'll average up and you can see it. So when I was using the ICOM, I'd say, OK, I'm just going to turn averaging off. And I'm just going to use the band scope because I really didn't want to use the uh, spectrum scope as much, the, the, the waterfall. So here's how the Kenwin works, which is I've never seen a radio do this before, is if you tune it, it just shifts the waterfall. It doesn't smear. It doesn't go on a diagonal line. And also, when you're tuning, the bandwidth you've got selected in DSP, whether it's 500 hertz or 250 or whatever, that's highlighted. So if you've got an, a signal that's on the waterfall, and you've just worked one guy and you're going to work the next one, you just tune it over to center that waterfall signal in the middle of the highlighted area. Now, what happens when you tuned it? Well, if you tuned it uh, to up in frequency, you got a little black spot on the right, a black area on the right. In this case, I tuned it down in frequency about five or 600 hertz. You can see the black area. That fills in over the next 30 seconds. But of course, usually the signals are so close together that we don't worry about this little dead spot for 30 seconds. So that, it made working signals so easy, particularly beginning the contest when you haven't, uh, you know, we haven't worked anyone yet. I could just start in this case on 160 meters and start at 1800 and just go one at a time is like shooting fish in a barrel. So that was really clever. And I talked to Warren, NR0V, who writes the GUI for and the software for the Apache Anon products. I said, could you do that? And he says, yeah, I could do that. So it'd be interesting to see if ICOM would say, well, maybe we should do that too. So I don't know if it'll ever happen. Maybe only Ken will do it. I don't know. Flex doesn't have that. Uh, uh, Apache doesn't have it at this point. But uh, Kenwood sure does. So here's what the 10 meter contest looked like. This was back December, second weekend of uh, December last year. And uh, Saturday afternoon, conditions were great, of course. But I've got 20 stations there in a 10 kilohertz bandwidth. So uh, of course, you can see the waterfall is so nice there. You can see history over like 30 seconds or a minute. So you can see where all the stations are, even though on the band scope, of course, the ones that weren't transmitting right that second, you can't see them. Now here's the 160 contest the week before. Another, again, a 10 kilohertz span. And you can see on the waterfall, I mean, look how many stations are piled in there. Typically, since I'm working uh, search and pounce, s and I'm not a great CW operator. I was better when I was a teenager for some reason. And uh, I used it more then. And I guess I, the brain was faster or something. I don't know what it is. So that was a typical 160 meter uh, uh, span over 10 kilohertz. I could take an hour and a half to work from 1800 to 1870 when you're making your first pass through the contest and you're uh, trying to work them all. Two other things to note on this. If, let me look at, let's look at this guy here. Now look how wide that is on, his, on the waterfall and even how wide it is on the spectrum scope. And then compare it to this guy over here. Look how narrow it is. So this guy's got terrible key clicks. And that's making interference that shouldn't be there. And I'm going to show you something about that in a little bit. Where this guy, well, he's nice and narrow. So we really need to be a good neighbor, whether we're on sideband and we don't want to splatter, on CW, we don't want terrible key clicks because we only got so much at the band. And uh, it's, uh, that's something we really emphasize at Contest University. If you do come to Dayton sometime, and uh, Contest University obviously sounds like all we talk about is contests, but it isn't. We've got tower safety. We've got ready stuff. We've got discussions of how to use a waterfall well. And so it's just a really great program. You get two free meals in the, in the price of 100 bucks, but uh, <laughs> so if you uh, if you really can come to Dayton a year a, a, a day early, it's a it's there in Dayton. That's really worth something to go to at least once. And the other thing, look up here, attenuation 12 dB. Are on 160, and you think, why do I want attenuation? I'll talk about that too. This is really important, particularly with a radio like the ICOM here, which is a direct sampling radio. It's a different world. So even though they were announced two Daytons ago and they didn't ship until later, the last 
two, two years ago, Dayton, and this past Dayton, this was the year of the hybrid. There wasn't anything else so great announced that was available. Of course, the K4 was announced, but we don't see that for a year. So um, in the past, we've had mostly superhead radios like the K3 or the FTDX 5000 or all the other superheads that you can think of. And then we've got the direct sampling radios, which are uh, Apache, Flex, and ICOM. Well, the ICOM meaning like the 7300, the 7610, or now the VHF radio, the 9700. Anybody here do VHF? Uh, uh, two meters, 70 centimeters, familiar with a little new ICOM? It's a direct sampling radio, a direct sampling in 70 centimeters and two, two meters. That's kind of amazing. So it, it's, uh, the world is changing for us. So now we've got the hybrids. And so they're, the main portion of the radio is a super hit. So we've got a, a mixer and a roofing filter, you know, one for sideband and one for CW or maybe two. And uh, then we go down to the lower frequency and get the DSP. Uh, in some cases, these hybrids, which that means the uh, 890S or the uh, 101D, if you're at field day, you may choose that as a better choice. Or do you have a ham that's a mile away or you're a multi multi If you're a contest station, even multi 2 or you've got a run station and a, a malt station, then you, of course, you worry about your own signal being a problem because uh, the malt stations look for something or other and uh, the, the run station is uh, going to clobber it if you're not, not careful. So the, the direct sampling radio looks at a wide bandwidth, and I'll show you a bit on that in a moment, but the Super Het's got that roofing filter. So almost everything is knocked out by the roofing filter. So this is a big difference between the, the two architectures, and you have to be a lot more careful what you're doing with the new direct sampling radios uh, from a potential overload. Most of the time, it's not a problem, but uh, I'm out in the country. I, nobody's within 13 miles of me, so it's not really a problem there. So if you're uh, dealing with a tough RF environment, and certainly can be an urban environment, it could be uh, uh, some field day is probably the worst example. How many of you have worked field day? Brought your equipment. You, if you've got two stations on the same band, this is tough. You know, a CW station, a sideband station, and now with FT8. This year, FT8 for the first time was supported, supported for field day. If you've got three stations on the same band, you've really got to get your act together and get your antennas separated. The, really the best way, W3LPL, really does it right at, uh, at see, W3AO. They run all their antennas in a line. So we don't, they're not looking at each other. They're all, all in a horizontal line. And this is, gets the best isolation. So you really, you've really got a challenge there in a case like that. So we think of the term roofing filter, which is what all these radios have had now for like 25 years. But with a direct sampling radio, it doesn't have a roofing filter per se, but the front end is what's determining how many signals are going to be hitting that A to D converter. So here's an example with the 7610. It's got a half octave filter. That's pretty much the way most radios have been for a long time as far as the front end, the LC filters. Well, it covers 11 to 15 megahertz. Okay, that's 20 meters, but there's a lot of broadcast stations between 11 and 15 megahertz. So that 80 analog to digital converter is having to cope with a lot of stuff. Now the 7610 has a tracking preselector. That will help but the 7300 doesn't, for instance, or the Flex or the Apache. No tracking pre-selectors there. So the key is, how are we handling our gain? How are we managing total gain of the radio, whether keep the preamp off unless you need it? Well, we certainly don't need it on 40 meters at night. And uh, use attenuation when appropriate, and I'll talk about that a bit more. Attenuation is really a win-win scenario in many cases. Uh, if your S meter is reading upscale on the band noise, and of course it's going to read upscale more on sideband than it does CW because of the bandwidth, but on 40 meters, someone say, what's your typical noise level on 40 meters at night in between stations? S7? Yeah. So. Yeah, but you know, it's, it would, I doubt you say it's S2. <laughs> so in that case, our receivers are so sensitive that you can dial in enough attenuation, you know, 6 dB, 12 dB, or whatever your steps are, so that we get it down towards S1. 
you really, that may be, may be counterintuitive, but if you're, the band noise is they just flickering the S meter, the receiver is still 20 or 30 dB more sensitive than that. So you're not losing anything if you put the attenuator in and nothing else when your person you're talking to stops talking for a moment, the AGC doesn't bring band noise up as loud as the station you're talking to. So the fatigue factor of long hours of operating, like in a contest, or you're trying to work that uh, de-expedition, you're trying for you know an hour or two, um, it really helps to what I call contest fatigue or just long operating time fatigue if you don't have the AGC just bringing up noise all the time. I like to set the AGC threshold uh, above band noise, 6 or 10 dB. And in a CW contest, for instance, I'd say 95, 98% of the signals are above AGC threshold even then, but there'll be a few stations that I gotta turn the volume up. But if, if the band noise isn't gonna be as loud as all those stations I'm working over the next six hours or something, <coughs> it really helps the fatigue factor. So that's the way I do it, and I had a lot, a lot of people come back after Contest University and say, wow, I tried that last year and it really worked out. So at night, on 40 and 80 meters, I'd say 6 or 12 dB would be kind of common. On 160 at night, 6, 12 dB and even 18 dB would not be a crazy number, assuming you're using your transmit antenna. Now, if you're using a beverage like we've heard about yesterday, uh, or something like that, well, that's a different story, but probably most of us use our transmit antennas to receive. So what's desirable today? Well, the first two examples are for CW. QSK or at least uh, semi-break-in. We don't want a lot of clicks or funny noises because that's kind of tiring. Uh, the audio peak filter really does help from a noise standpoint. So I, I, even if I'm only running 500 hertz CW bandwidth on the DSP or 250, I like that audio peak filter at similar bandwidth and it knocks the noise down a little bit. Uh, I can't imagine buying a radio today that doesn't have a band scope. Now you could, of course, add one to the K3 with an external box, but now the K4, of course, is gonna have that built in. Everything that's come out in the last few years, well, since the 7300 is like, wow, a thousand dollar radio has got a band scope. So it's, uh, I haven't had a band scope for a long time. I bought used ICOM 781s, which when they came out like 25 years ago were six or $7,000. I didn't have that kind of money that long ago, and but today, of course, uh, when I did buy them, they were like a half of that. And, and uh, so we've had band scopes for a long time, but not as almost guaranteed part of what was we'd expect in a radio today. We need a good user interface. That GUI that we were just talking about, uh, we, we don't want to have to uh, do a lot of, uh, in, if it's in a contest, we don't have to be getting the mouse out meter, or going into menu and do a lot of things we would prefer to do just once. So we need a good user interface. And of course, our logging program, I can't imagine logging without a computer these days. If I go back to when I did my first contest when I was in high school, and we had a community uh, contest station where one guy provided this contest station, we had like six of us, we'd get on 160 meters, and we had a piece of paper on the wall that was this big, and we tried to keep track of our dupes on a piece of paper. Uh, our CQ machine was a tape recorder, a real-to-real -real tape recorder, that had tones on it, the key to relay, and the relay key to the transmitter. So think of what we've got now. <laughs> so, so those were the good old days, I guess. Um, if you do have a computer-controlled radio, like a Flex or an Apache, or, or uh, uh, some of the lower tier ones, you probably want some sort of a knob at least to tune. So the Flex has a Flex knob, and, and they've got the uh, DJ, uh, they've got the, uh, uh, no, the Maestro, and then uh, the Apache has the DJ console, which is really meant for something else in the, in the uh, radio and the t TV world and, and DJs and all that. So you can make them run your radio. So that's pretty handy. Like I say, I'd just soon not have to touch the mouse too much in a contest. So let's talk about numbers now, the things that we can read in QST or CQ or um, in my website. You know, what do, what do these dynamic range numbers mean? What's typical? And, uh, and really, there's quite a range, and they all can work really well. So
So clear back in 1975 in QST and, and the Ham Radio Magazine, I certainly wish Ham Radio Magazine was still around. Do you guys remember that? Yeah, absolutely. This was the most technical publication we've ever had in Jim Fisk. It was just phenomenal. And I was lucky enough to have several articles published in there. Well, back then in 75, they defined dynamic range, which probably military or something knew what this meant, but we didn't have those terms. We just knew sensitivity and uh, things like that. So dynamic range was defined as feed in two signals, and when you start developing distortion products in the radio that were equal to noise floor of the radio, and what did they define noise floor as? They had to define that too. Before we just heard sensitivity, you know, half a microvolt for 10 dB plus signal noise ratio. Well, now we heard noise floor, and that meant a 3 dB signal to noise. So we would feed in a signal and the read it on an analog meter, preferably RMS, but uh, you can get away without that. And we feed in that signal and the, the noise with no signal tuned in would read something and then we tune the signal in, it would go up 3 dB. So that's the noise floor. And then when we did the dynamic range test, we tuned in the third order product and that went up 3 dB. And therefore we had the definition of dynamic range. So let's say, the noise floor of the radio was minus 128 dBm, and we took a minus 28 signal to make that third order product come up 3 dB, and that's the definition. The difference between the minus 128 and the minus 28, that's the 100 dB. Of course, we don't have to have 100 dB radio, but that was kind of the magic number. Everybody wanted 100 dB radio, and there weren't any then. So we don't have to wonder where that third order product is. This is just math. Uh, if it's a 2KC test, is which I actually implemented that a long time ago and kind of forced the industry to go there. And I'll explain why in a moment. But if we're two test tones or two KCs apart, we know exactly where the third order product is. It's going to be two KCs above the high frequency signal two KCs below the two, the lower frequency signal. Of course, if the spacing is 20 kilohertz, then it's the same difference. Um, when those dynamic range uh, tests were done in the 70s, they only tested at 20 kilohertz. And that was OK back in that day with the way radios were designed. And it was perfectly adequate. But then we started getting a radio with a roofing filter, even though the term roofing filter wasn't coined at that point. And my, I, I bought an R4C that we heard about yesterday. And it tested in the reviews fine. And I used it a 160 meter contest and it totally fell apart. Well, the radio is what it is. If the test says it's good and in the air it's terrible, well, then the test is no good. And so, at this point, we're talking about uh, 1976, and I had a couple of signal generators, an HP 606 and a 608, and they both would end, could cover 20 meters, and I tested this Drake, and I found, well, gee, if I tested them at 20 kilohertz, it looked great. If I squeezed them down to 2 kilohertz apart, because the roofing filter was 8 kcs wide, and those two signals made it through the roofing filter, and then the dynamic range went from like 85 down to 58 or something, and 58 is not very good. And um, so it took years for the league to kind of catch up with that. So now we know the test, you look in their QST reviews, and it will always get two KC numbers. But that wasn't the case in the 70s or 80s or the 90s. <clears throat> so the other thing that the league um, has done since 2012 was define this reciprocal mixing dynamic range. And uh, if you look up uh, Bob Allison's reviews, he's got sidebars on these two years uh, that's a little, little discussion of why this is important. And it's also a case where if we go back to about 2008, uh, the league changed how they tested things. And they were almost all those synthesized radios back in that time period, the synthesizers were poor. And the synthesizers were much worse than the dynamic range of the radio close in. So for a while they were saying, well, they're phase noise limited, and I used that term too. But the problem was the league decided, well, we want to measure the, the real dynamic range, even if that distortion product is buried in noise. And one example is the FT, FTDX3000. If we 
went to really narrow bandwidth like we do for FT8, the you know, bandwidths are really narrow. If you went to a three hertz bandwidth or something, we could measure that distortion product even if it was 18 dB buried in phase noise. So you would get a publication that would say the dynamic range is 100 dB, but in reality it was 82 because the phase noise was dominant. So it uh, took a long time to move the league along, but they're there now since uh, 2012 and 13. And uh, so the numbers we get to see on QST now make sense. But I had a real battle with them for a long time over that. My wife says I'm a troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the graphical th thing that I found on the web that I think really describes what phase noise, reciprocal mixing, dynamic range is all about. So we've got this bullet nose little signal over there, and that's the weak guy, and it's the it's our last one to be DXCC, let's say, or it's the multiplier number uh, 40 that we get the bigger score. So that's what we're trying to copy. But let's say 500 hertz away is a really strong signal and it's a perfect signal. Now, of course, there is no such thing as a perfect signal, but let's say it was a perfect signal, absolutely no noise on it, nothing. But our local oscillator, every local oscillator has noise. Or the clock, if it's a direct sampling radio, it has noise. That's a lot easier to do, though. So the phase noise on our local oscillators, which were pretty terrible 20, 20, 15, 10 years ago, that noise on the local oscillator that mixes down in our mixture, so that's the way our superhet radio works, it puts noise on that perfect signal that's right next to the weak one we want to copy. So in effect, it modulates the strong signal that's right 500 hertz or a kilohertz away, and then the noise ends up on the weak signal. So the weak signal was clean, the strong signal was clean, but our LO wasn't. So that's why it's uh, so critical to have much better synthesizers, and now we do. So there was a, there were a period there of 20 years where reciprocal mixing really dominated close in over the dynamic range measurement. So now we've got a limited number of super hat radios that don't have a phase noise problem, and that, of course, would be the new Kenwood and the new Yezu, uh, the K3S, but if you have a K3 for 250 bucks, you can get the new synthesizer, so that would be really good. The Hilberling, kind of expensive, it's only $18,000. Not too many of them sold in the U.S. I think there's seven of them. I think in Europe there's about 100 of them, but it's more a sideband radio doesn't do QSK and all that. But the 7851 is a great radio, but it's $12,000. So there aren't too many of the super heads that are really great, except those two new ones, which are under you know $4,000 or cheaper. But now in the direct sampling radios, all you need is a good clock. In other words, the crystal oscillator that makes this kind of computer radio work, you can make a good clean crystal oscillator a lot easier than a synthesizer. So so far, nobody's messed that up with the, the, the radios that are you know $1,000 and up. I don't know what the phase noise is like on these little dongles. But then uh, I, I use a Perseus receiver to do a lot of measurements with, and it's got a really clean clock. So uh, it's kind of hard to screw up the direct sampling radios from that respect. So we've got the, uh, the 7610, the 7300, all the flexes that are the 6000 series, and the Apache Annan. So they're, they're just fine. Do we need a 100 dB radio? Well, we didn't even have 80 dB radios for about 20 years. Almost all the radios that came out between the, well, the first upconversion radio I remember is a TR7, and that was about 2003. And, uh, you know, my Pro 3 that I used to have, um, it was 70, 75, some of them 65. Uh, the FT2000, about hmm, below 60. <laughs> uh, not too good. So um, do we really have to have the 100 dB radios? Well, not most of the time. I mean, if, if we really did, we couldn't have lived with all those, that 20 year period when the radios were mostly 70 dB radios. Adequate on sideband, which I'll explain in a moment, but not really so much in a big CW pilot. But uh, we need to know how we can make the best of what we have. Here's a list of the top 18 transceivers off my website. Now, not the first 18 in the list. 
you will find that over the years, I tested like four K4, K3s you know, with the old synthesizer, the new synthesizer, the direct sampling radios, there was variations, more variations in the direct sampling radios than the legacy radios. So I've got, you know, two 7300s, two 7610s, for instance. So this is the top 18 specific models. And look at it, that's from 90 dB at the 10 Tech Eagle, clear up to 110 for this new Yezu. And that was the highest that it was um, I've ever measured. And, but look at all in between. We've all sorts, we got almost half of them are better than 100, and there's nothing wrong with a 90 dB radio. So look at all the choices we have today. Whether you buy new, I mean, you can buy a 7300 for $1,000. Uh, you can buy the, the top of the line icon for $12,000. Uh, but all those ones in between, pretty much we can buy a lot of radio day between three and 4,000 brand new. But it's, the 7300 came out, they've sold about 30,000 of them. How many have a 7300? Uh, it, it crashed the used market. So it, before it came out, the best bang for the buck was the uh, TS-590, whether the S or the SG. And um, it's still a great radio. And I might take it to field day before a 7300 because of the fact that it's got a roofing filter and is, it will have a little bit higher blocking level. But you really, when you're talking about working DX, working contests, any of these are gonna, gonna do a good job, particularly if we get a handle on the um, total gain for the direct sampling. I mean, you can buy a used, what, probably 590 for $600. I just to answer. SG, not for about, it was S and 8, I think it was. Yeah, I mean, that's a bargain. I think when the, they pretty much, before the 7300 came along, they were about 1500 I think, something like that. I think they started out at 1800 Yeah, I think they're 13 now. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Um, so why do we need a better radio for a CW in a, in a pileup or something? Now, if we're just chit-chatting, uh, so what? Um, transmitted bandwidth of adjacent signals is often the limit today. A CW signal, if we're not screwing up and having terrible key clicks, it's about a KC wide at minus 60. Now, if we just put a rock on the key, we're probably... 100 hertz wide or 50 hertz wide, but once you start sending something, I mean, every DX signal you're working, they're 599, right? So, but even if they're S1, they're 599. <laughs> so at 60 dB down, a, a good, clean CW signal is about a KC wide, but on sideband, believe it or not, it's about 10 KCs wide. So that's the problem is, is in uh, what's, What's that strong signal that's calling CQ contest, CQ contest forever? Um, and he's you know, 30 over nine. Or if the CW guy's uh, doing the same. So here's the difference in the bandwidth of a CW signal depending upon how you selected the rise time, which now with all the modern radios, you can adjust that. That said, except for the Elecraft because they won't let you screw up. They've decided that they don't want the Elecraft K3 to have bad key clicks. Now, I don't know why they decided that. Almost everyone else lets you be a really bad neighbor and pick a terrible rise time. So the top graph there is, a, that's a TS-890 and most other radios at one millisecond. Now, you should not have the choice of picking one millisecond, but you do. But then if we go to six milliseconds, which is what I'd suggest you use, Look at that difference, one KC difference in, one KC offset from that signal, 25 dB difference in the key clicks, the loudness of the key clicks. And that's just not fair that uh, someone should be that wide, like we saw in that picture a little bit ago. So you're not being a good neighbor and please don't pick one millisecond or two milliseconds. And I, I've yelled at the OEMs and well, too bad. And it's not that much different on sideband. Uh, there aren't many Class A rigs. Yezu was the only one that offered them. Uh, we've got here a picture of a K3 and a, a, a Mark V, a Yezu Mark V in Class A. And you say, well, gee, why is he talking about Class A? But we now have something called pure signal and pre-distortion. Have any of you in the, been in the broadcast world and heard about pre-distortion? I mean, the TV transmitters and things like that, of course, they run constant power in one frequency, so it's not so hard. 
but it's possible to clean up a signal. But let's compare here what this Class A rig did to say, okay, we have to be six kilohertz away from a Class B or Class AB K3 to have the distortion products be down 60 dB. What does that mean? The guy's calling CQ contest and he's 30 over 9 or 40 over 9, and you're trying to work a guy that's S3. That's your 60 dB. Uh, but then in the Class A case, you're 60 dB down, one and a half KCs away from the edge of his signal. So that'd be really nice if all the signals on sideband were that clean. And um, you probably say, well, now what is this funny shape? That is feeding in band limited white noise, which kind of approximates speech. When you're saying CQ, 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 what, where's it going to splatter on the S's? Because that's where the articulation is that Bob's talked about. That's where uh, the, the signal will widen out. But you've probably seen two-tone tests in, in, uh, CQ, in uh, QST or CQ. So there's your standard two-tone test, and there's your white noise test. And they come out the same. But it kind of gives you an idea that we don't transmit two tones, so it doesn't really make a lot of sense. But when we're saying CQ, that's how uh, our bandwidth of a signal is. So uh, it comes out, there's no difference. But the funny thing is, when we test with a two-tone test, and you'll see that sometimes in the long-form reports in QSD or on the web, that the third-order product sometimes is less than the fifth order. And that makes no sense, but it just happens, but it never shows up when we do the white noise test. Um, so there, it, it, sometimes we can get a third-order number, you think, wow, that's really great, but then you look at the fifth-order number and it's worse. Um, so the, we just get that anomaly when we do a two-tone test. So it can sometimes be misleading. So Apache has pre-distortion. Every new linear that's come out in the last few years, whether it's come out from Elecraft or, or Palstar or uh, the ones out of Europe, they've got a sampler output. It's down about 50 or 60 dB, and that's what can be used with this pre-distortion. NR0V, Warren Pratt, who now lives in Loveland, Colorado, uh, he wrote all this code a DSP code and this what's called pre, pre, pure signal, pure signal, which is this pre-distortion, and it takes a sample of the output of either the rig or if we've got an amplifier with a sampler or we can use an external sampler, and we feed that back into the radio and we invert it. So the distortion's inverted and it cancels out. While I was talking to KA0KA -A, uh, just here in a uh, few weekends ago, now he, he likes wide signals as far as bandwidth. I don't agree with that. Bob talked about that yesterday. Uh, this, this signal is his signal with pure signal, but he's running it at 4.5 kilohertz bandwidth. If I was running it, I'd be at 2.8 or 2.7. But the point is, we don't have any wings on this. I mean, he's straight up and down. His, his bandwidth is what he chose, not what I'd pick. But it's just perfect. But look at this guy there. Just happened to be down the band 14 kilohertz. Look at all the splatter products while he's talking. And if we see he, his main signal was narrower, but his splatter's not. And I'd just squeeze that down, and we'd have it what I consider virtually a perfect signal. Elecraft says this is in the future with the K4, and including their sampler coming out of their KPA 1500. And Flex has talked about it since day one. Hopefully we'll see uh, pre-distortion, at least in the SDR type rigs. Because uh, there's it's all that's all done in the computer, where you've got all sorts of processing power. Whether an ICOM or a Kenwood or a Yezu could do it, I don't know. What uh, what's the main cause for them, them wings on the side <clears throat> overdriving? Well in this case it could be. But as we saw with those uh, back here, even if we're running our rig properly, we don't have knobs to the right, we do, ALC is not buried, and we're not putting 100 watts into a linear that takes 50 watts worth of drive, the third order distortion products are down about 30 dB, and the fifth order may be 40 dB. So we, it's just the fact that Solid state amps aren't that clean. Now, the cleanest rig I've ever owned from, from odd order distortion products is a 32S3, and we saw one here yesterday. It had 6146 finals. It had said negative feedback in the PA, 
and it was really clean. The numbers were better than anything you can buy today, and unless you use this pre-distortion. So it's just the, the fact that a 13.8 volt PA isn't very clean. Now the TS990 had a 50 volt PA and it was about 6 dB better and it was really consistent even at 50 watts, 100 watts, or 180 watts, it degraded a bit at 200. So uh, the higher voltage PAs are a little bit better, uh, but we, were there nowhere like the Collins was, nowhere like the uh, pre-distortion is or the Class A. The trouble with Class A was you had to have a 200 watt rig to have a Class A uh, on sideband. You know, it could be 200 watts on Class A B or Class B, but to be on a Class A was only rated at 75 watts, and um, so and it's in a lot of heat and a lot of noise. So really, there weren't very many that did that. But uh, if you ever uh, uh, W6XX was one that uh, had a tremendous signal. He ran it in Class A in an 8877. So uh, you could have a clean signal in the air, but it takes a lot of work. Let's see, did I have the right thing? Yeah, okay. So how do we optimize what we have? You know, I didn't own a, I don't know, do I still? Yeah, I, I haven't owned a 100 dB radio for a long time, and uh, but, you know, I've got a 90 dB something or other. So the thing is, uh, most of the time, your 85 or 90 dB radio is adequate. N2IC is a big contester. He now he used to live in Denver, but now in New Mexico. And he wins contests with a pair of 590s. So the, it's, it's, uh, that most of the time our radios are not going to stop us from you know, making those multipliers or weak signals or whatever that's uh, important in the contest or the, the expeditions or things like that. But whatever the dynamic range is, consider it a window that, let's say it's 85 dB. Well, we can move the position of the window around by the preamp or the attenuator. So if we're on 10 meters, we need the preamp fine. If we're on 40 meters, we certainly don't. And we can turn on the attenuator and take that window of usability and position it properly depending on the band. Since about 2008, when the K3 came out, receivers have really improved. Um, transmitters, not so much, or I'd say not at all, except for the pre-distortion with the Apache. But uh, on the transmit side, we have splatter on sideband. We have the key clicks that you saw there in that one case. And the, uh, the other is transmit broadband noise. We don't hear much about that. Matter of fact, I think ICOM is the only one that even mentions that in an ad where they say our transmitted noise is low. Uh, during the, this CQ Worldwide 160 contest in January, uh, there was one station that was driving me nuts from these key clicks, and it just, it, that's, it's not an advantage for anybody. So we uh, don't bury your ALC, probably don't run your processor full open. Try to keep the transmitter as clean as you can. Don't pick crazy uh, fast uh, rise times for CW. And uh, the broadband noise, well, we can't do a lot about that. But it's amazing how much difference there is from one rig to the next. Now, the K3S there, this is a little techie nerd, but the 10 KC offset, the K3S there is really clean. And it even go out 100 kilohertz, it doesn't change much, but it's like a phenomenal number to start with. Let's look at the 7610. Well, it's not as good close in at 10 kilohertz, but it's virtually identical to the uh, K3 at 100 kilohertz. So that's a case where like at field day, if, if the sideband signal or the CW signal has a bunch of transmitted noise, then, uh, and your CW and your sideband guys are on only 100 KCs apart, well, the noise is gonna cause a problem. Then there's some like the uh, the, uh, the the 7300 and the, and the uh, 3000, the FTDX 3000, at almost no improvement as we go off at higher separations. 100 kilohertz is about the same as 100. So if that's a case where field day, they might say, well, let's not bring that rig to field day. The the 890s, well, it, it really improves at the wider spacing. So we just they're very different depending on just which model. I won't go into this a lot, but 
as we drive, as we turn the power down, the noise pretty much tends to stay constant, but the signal came down, so often the noise is worse at the lower drive levels, and most of our amps today, if they're solid state, may only take 30 or 40 watts of drive. So in that case, the, uh, the, noise, fact, the noise issue is exacerbated. I'm going to jump on the league one more time, causing trouble as usual. Um, the league has a Roden Schwartz phase noise measuring equipment. It cost about a hundred grand. I think it may have been donated by Ulrich Rota, but it only measures phase noise. And most of the time, that's okay. Most of the time, phase noise dominates, but not all the time. So, from a transmitted noise standpoint, we can have phase noise, and we can have amplitude noise. And if you look at them both, that's called composite noise. And that's what we really are concerned about. We don't care when we're dealing with that field day situation that the guy's keying away and you tune up the band 100 kilohertz. You're tch, 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 tch. We, we want to know what the total noise is. And so we need to measure both. And the, uh, the, the league's equipment at the moment only measures one. And for instance, with the 7300 at 30 watts, there's a big difference. And here's a measurement also with a piece of rotor Schwartz equipment. This one is the current model, and it can measure phase noise, AM noise, or composite noise. If you can see the, the graphs here, this is the 7300 at 30 watts. This is the, the blue line is the phase noise plot. Well, it, it really falls off. This is really good at 10 kilohertz. Look how much it's dropped off. But this is kind of an anomalous rig. Here at about 200 hertz, the phase noise and the AM noise are about the same. And the green line is the composite noise. And if the two signals are the same, then they should go up 3 dB. And they do. It's only 5 dB per division. So look here, out here at 10 kilohertz, the composite noise is drastically worse than the phase noise. The, the league tried to solve this by getting a diode detector for their piece of equipment, and it didn't work. And so the last I heard from Ulrich Rota of Rota and Schwartz was that maybe they could come up with a bargain price that the league could get the new equipment. I don't know what will happen. But I've been able to measure this with a Perseus. Now, anybody here heard of the Perseus receiver? It's a phenomenal FFT box. It's a, I don't use it to receive signals by using it as a piece of test equipment. I can measure this composite noise uh, for most rigs with that $1,000 Perseus. And if you buy it out of the UK, you can get it for 800. And, and I can even mix it down. I've been able to measure the composite noise of this new Icon 9700 on two meters or 70 centimeters or 1296 by mixing it down with a, a, you know, a good high level mixer and then measuring it on 20 meters or whatever. So you can make these measurements with something that costs a thousand bucks instead of a hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So the numbers can we can come up with the numbers without being uh, on equipment that we couldn't possibly afford. Solid state linears, not so linear. Uh oh, causing trouble again. <laughs> The ARRL in 1997 published a compendium of about six amplifiers, all tubes, of course, back then. And every one of them, the third order distortion products were down 40 to 50 dB. And that's pretty good. And as a matter of fact, that's better than a lot of rigs today. But the better rigs, that's about what they, where they are too. There's in the in this spring we had a review of a very popular amp which I'll tell you what it is that was the uh, Ellercraft KPA 1500 and the distortion is only down 30 no comment was made that it's only down 30 versus 40 or 50 that we considered typical in 1997 uh, the uh, the flex power genius hasn't been reviewed yet in QST but that was measured in Denver and um, it's only down 27 dB on 10 meters and 6 meters. So we've got two major OEMs, amps that people certainly are buying for five, six, what, six or seven thousand dollars, and they're 10 to 20 dB worse than what we had in 1997. So that's sad. Now they do all have a sampler output. So if you're using an Apache, 
and it fed the sampler into the Apache, then you could get those numbers where the distortion is down 60 dB. But we've only got one brand right now that will do that. So we're finding that the receivers are now are phenomenal. We've got 18 of them that I had on my list that had, had 90 dB or better dynamic range, but the transmitters aren't as clean and the amplifiers are worse. So we've really got a situation where the, the uh, half the equation is phenomenal and the other half is not. And whether we can make progress there, I don't know. Uh, I have no idea whether anything besides the computer-run radios will ever offer pre-distortion. We just don't know yet. So what's the bottom line? At night, uh, your receiver is way too sensitive, and uh, so use attenuation. There's no point in band noise reading upscale on your S meter. Now, if you're just rag chewing, you probably don't care. But uh, if you're in any kind of a situation where you think that you might be in an overload, like look at the guys in Europe that are on 40 meters with all those broadcast stations above 7,200. Thank God, God they're above 7,200 now. And those signals, you know, megawatts and 10 megawatts and all that crazy stuff. So particularly if you've got a direct sampling radio there, you've got to pay attention. You better have your, your uh, tracking pre-selector on and your attenuation on or you're going to have an issue. You can get away with being sloppy with the, direct, with the uh, legacy radios, with the, the regular roofing filters, because the roofing filter is going to knock out about everything except, you know, 500 hertz or a kilohertz or 5 kilohertz or whatever. So uh, in the case of the 7610, just as an example of the direct sampling ones that don't have roofing filters, the, um, that lists the below the red there, it says there's the bandwidth of those half octave filters. So if we look at the 40 meter bandpass filter is picking up, it's passing everything from six to eight megahertz. There's a lot of broadcast stations between six and eight megahertz besides what's on 40 meters. And then like I showed earlier in 20 meters, it's 11 to 15. So, um, but if, well, if WRTC, do you, everybody know what WRTC was? It contests, it, it rotates around the world. Um, so it was in Germany this past year, and they had every brand known to man. And we had, we had the direct samplers, the legacies, everything, and, and they obviously figured out how to optimize their receiver and don't, you know, run, not run a preamp at night on 40 meters. So the radios will work fine. You just have to be sure you're paying attention. <clears throat> I've covered that uh, at nighttime. Don't, don't be running the preamp. Uh, that the, the dynamic range, we can just optimize where we place it. Uh, get feedback from other people. What, what's your friends you doing? What are the big contesters? If you, if you uh, see what they're running, and um, just take hints from them. The, the, the technical numbers are great, but we also need feedback from the field. And like I say, I have uh, enjoyed now writing up some muses after a contest and say, this is what, how radio really worked well, and uh, maybe this was a weak point. Don't be a slave to one number, and that would include my one number. I mean, I get people go to my website and they'll say, oh, there's the new Yezu at 110, I gotta have that radio. Probably not, um, but we need to look at the whole picture. But at the same time, we can weed out the duds. And so, Let's just say, you say, I'm going to pick 90 dB or better. Well, we had all sorts of choices. Uh, and then once we've said the basic performance is there, well, what's also important? Well, I like good agronomics. I don't want to have a radio that's sort of clumsy to use. If it breaks all the time, I got no use for it. I Hopefully, the factory can fix it. And um, we want, as Bob was talking about, clean audio, clean receive audio, clean transmit audio. Uh, Everything's got built-in EQ pretty much today. That's really great for uh, both on the receive side and the transmit side. So you can get, we don't sound like this, you know, uh, <laughs> like Bob did yesterday. Uh, noise reduction, noise blanking. That's pretty important in an urban environment. I don't have a lot of noise to uh, deal with out in the country, but uh, you know, most of us are in the city and I have a house in the city still and uh, there's times when I can hardly copy when the line noise pops up. 
One thing my friend Rick, that I'm gonna give a link to him in a moment, uh, Rick in Germany, DJ Zero IP, he said, you really should talk about cost of ownership is also something important. Um, there have been some expensive radios in the past um, six or eight years where the repair costs could easily be $1,000 or $2,000 just to get some one thing fixed. Um, the, the ICOM 7800, almost all the, uh, the uh, TCX, I mean the oven, uh, the oven oscillator in it burned up virtually every time. And a new board was almost 1000 bucks. My uh, TS990 that I owned, I didn't lose the, I lost the microprocessor in it with the EMP, but one guy I know, his power supply went out. It's a custom power supply, $900 for the supply, parts and labor, $1,350 plus shipping both ways. So it was about $1,600 to get the radio fixed. And this is just a thing we need to think of. Um, it was part of the equation. Of course, if you, if money is no object, but most of us, it's an object. So there's, a whole slew of things we need to really look at, uh, not just the one number and, um, you know, don't say I've got to have that 110 dB radio and just forget everything else. What don't we have to worry about today? Well, sensitivity hasn't been a problem since the 75A4. Um, a little more of an issue maybe with some of the SDRs on six meters, um, for instance, um, or 10 meters. The Apache has a what they call an L and A on six meters, but you can't turn it on in 10 meters. Well, that's sort of dumb. I mean, if it's built in there, why not let it be accessible? So that's a programming thing. And I've complained about the uh, not enough flexibility on the flex products as far as how you pick your preamps. So, you know, if, it, if it's there, why shouldn't the user have total capability to use it how he wants? Selectivity with DSP is really not a problem today. Drift, drift, what's that? Well, maybe on our boat anchors. Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Alignment. Well, heck, the Collins and the Drake, you had to get all those slugs going up and down and the R390A, you had to keep them in alignment. We don't have that anymore. Um, unless you're really in a tough RF, RF environment, like field day, a ham a, a mile away, a half a mile away, I got a friend there. Well, don't you, two of you are like neighbors? Yeah. Whoa. Now that's about as bad as you can get. Bandpass filters, then you could work. He's on 20, I'm on 40, or a happy camper, but you know, boy, that's terrible. Uh, 40 meters in Europe, that's a different story. Uh, you gotta really uh, help out sometimes with that with some you know, pre-selector or something like that. What's most important? Well, this is gonna kind of be funny for someone who's been testing receivers and emphasizing that, but uh, location, antennas, operator skill, and then your radio. That's how I'd pick them out. I mean, if I was in the mountains at uh, my mother-in-law's house for weekends for seven years. My takeoff angle to Japan was 40 degrees. I didn't work anybody in Japan. Thank goodness I had a decent takeoff angle to uh, Europe. Um, I moved out in the country and bought 10 acres and put up six towers because I wanted the, I, I really love playing with antennas and so that was kind of a goal of mine. But most of us probably can't do that. So operator skill, we can all improve that. I certainly could. And, uh, but pick a radio that makes sense, is, has all the features you want, and uh, don't, just, don't just pick one number and say that's the only thing that's important. Get rid of the duds. The, the link here that I was talking about, this uh, www.dj0ip, he's got several things that he calls Sherwood shootouts. There's a half a dozen rigs there where I used them in contests and I wrote up some comments and sent them off to him and he published it. It's kind of fun to read if you uh, want to look and see what I thought. Maybe I'm causing trouble again, I don't know. So there you have it. <laughs> yes. Sure. Uh, two questions, really. One is, uh, do they have a lot of Class D amplifiers being used uh, in power amplifiers nowadays? And uh, the second question is, doesn't that add to this distortion you're talking about? Well, there, the Class D and, um, and Class E for AM, you know, there's AM rigs now. The guys on 80 and uh, 80, 75 meters and 40 and maybe 160, they're running those classes. But in general, no. I don't know of any any Class D 
uh, type amplifier that would be appropriate for sideband. But it is certainly a way to have a, a, a you know, 275 watt AM signal that isn't isn't a boat anchor. That's really the size of this projector, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that's just we we'll, won't we'll, we'll call it an advertisement. I'm my my technician that's worked for me now for 27 years is 81. I'm 72, so I'm pretty much winding the company down. I do have the five kits that replace the modules in the R4C to improve that, and they'll probably be around for a few more months. And when they're gone, they're gone. Um, I sold the synchronous detector that one of your friends here had. Uh, with these R390A, and I sold that for 30 years, but uh, I couldn't see running another hundred of them. So I'm kind of fading into the sunset. The, all the roofing filters and all that are long gone, mainly because the switching components went through the roof. When I first started selling those TO5 relays that were, did the switching for the R4C roofing filter, they were five bucks. Now they're 35 bucks for one relay. The sockets used to be two bucks. They're 10 bucks now. So it's just the, the cost of producing, you know, small quantity stuff is just crazy. I don't know how anybody goes into business today and brings out a kit, but. Where did you, how did you get started? That, I'll tell you, that's a fluke. And, and testing all these radios, it's a total fluke. I bought an R4C and my, my friend, where I grew up in Cincinnati, he bought an R4C, K8RRH. And uh, Bob's talked to him on the air. Um, we bought these radios and they didn't work in a CW contest. So that was the case, well, I own this radio, it tests well, but it doesn't play well. What's wrong? Well, the test was wrong because we needed to t get the two test signals through the roofing filter. Well then, gee, if the roofing filter is eight KCs wide and I came up with a CW roofing filter, which now of course is common, like with a K3 or something like that, then the problem goes away because I knocked out all those other signals. So then I started testing all these radios and CW Electronics in town, which is now HRO. They would loan me things off the shelf to use. They used to sell used equipment. And I could go in there and Alan Applegate would say, yeah, take it home for the weekend, test it, bring it back on Monday. <laughs> so I got started testing all these radios and, and published it in a catalog in paper. And then, of course, the internet came along. And then I started putting you know, that chart up there. So it was just, it just happened. <laughs> <laughs> for, for, it certainly wasn't planned. Yeah. I have a question of a rather different nature. So I'm at LSU, and I'm the trustee for the HAM club. Mm -hmm. And students come to me with their new licenses, and they've just been able to contest, say, for the first couple of times. The book's been set. <laughs> their budgets are nowhere you say a thousand dollars to them, and they go, "I'm never going to have a radio." I mean, they have other problems. I understand. Okay, so is it still possible to to, to point to? I'm not asking for models. A 20, 25 year old radio, and say, "Look, if you learn to operate this way, turn on the attenuator, reduce the RF gain if you have to," that they can still make use of one of these. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean. When we're talking about these high-performance radios, 90 dB and up, or 85 dB and up, most of the time we're nowhere near stressing a radio. So go to the ham fest. Okay, maybe the TS 590 SG is 800 dollars, but you can maybe there's a Swan there. I mean, it used to seem like in the 70s everybody had a Swan something or other, and um, a TR3. Now, admittedly, won't have a CW filter, but so what? I mean, when I was on the air in 1961 as a novice, I had crystal controlled rig, like maybe a lot of you did, and a receiver that didn't know the term crystal filter. It was a national built in the same year I was born, 1947. So the, the used market is phenomenal, QTH.com, uh, eBay's maybe, I mean, it's just a little more expensive, seems like on eBay, but certainly go to your ham fest. Yeah, they had a. Kenwood TS430 for 300 bucks asking, and uh, I bought a 35 amp uh, power supply for 75. I'm sure there were 20 amp ones that would run that 230 for 50 bucks. Right. So for 350, you got those two things. 
You can run just a plain up tuned dipole antenna. You don't need that antenna tuner, but add a hundred bucks for an antenna tuner. And, but think of you're out the door there for 350 if you paid the asking prices uh, for it to get started. And if you just look at the old ones, the old Kenwoods and the ICOMs, uh, four, four, they had four, like five different Kenwoods for sale there. It would take a T. 300 up to about 450, something what, like that. What would a TS um, 830 cost? I mean, that had tubes in it at, in the finals and a 12 BY7, and I bet you could buy one for 200 bucks, don't you think? Uh, uh, an 830 maybe? Maybe. 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 The, the market goes yeah. upside down now when you get back to the older hybrids. Sometimes, you know, the tube sets, uh, the boat anchors over there were uh, more expensive than the ones that I just talked about. Uh, <laughs> really? Because really? they were generally reconditioned and restored and, uh, and uh, more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're talking about a TR3, they had a TR4 there for 250. Well, okay. yeah. I, I ran TR4's mobile for years. You yeah. had, had the TR4 seat in there for 350. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I mean, what a bargain. So yeah, so tell them to come to the, your local, support your local ham fest, always. I go within a... No, I, I understand that. It's just, you know, I don't want students being who, they get interested, we've got a fairly good state, we've got enough radio there at the, at LSU that they can, you know, yeah. they, they can contest reasonably, um, you know, and some of them really like that. But when they'll talk about a personal radio, you start talking numbers like this, and they, well, it's just not in there. Well, that's surprising because they probably walk out the door when they graduate with maybe a hundred thousand in student debt. Now, they, they they just don't even blink an eye at that. I hope that's true because the people that, that are, uh, no, no. I mean, I, it, it's just crazy today for. Well, my kids went to school at LSU and walked out with zero debt. Good for you. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, all right. But one kid didn't have tops. He told her. Well, one of the things, too, if they can, uh, you know, make some local contacts and network with the local folks, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of us around that have spare radios or extra radios that are just sitting on a shelf. That, well, my, my question was not that I, I didn't know that these possibilities existed. It was, is it is it still worth to recommend them that they ought to pursue this kind of thing? Ab absolutely. I mean, I mean it, you could... Uh, um, you could buy probably any radio made in the last 30 years and have ball, have a ball. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I started off with an ICOM 718. Sure. It was adequate to play yeah. with. And then I got fancy and I went to the 756 Pro 3 because I had to have the display. Yeah. Right. Okay. But so you can start off low and as you say, find some great bargains at the ham fest. It's to get you on the air. And and, and and really and emphasized and learning how to be a good operator yeah. playing with the, the gains and, the, and all that and emphasize HF because I mean, we've got seven or eight hundred thousand hams in the US and probably 80 percent of them are on walkie talkies yeah. and you can add a band scope and a waterfall to almost every radio out there <laughs> yes if you know what you're doing and yeah you can take audio off your radio and learn it through a computer using yep. GNC Make yourself any kind of scope you want. So you, you, you grow it and you grow out in different directions if you want to. And it's just right. a, it's an exploration. No, this was just a question about the, these are people who, believe it or not, are on a budget. <laughs> well, okay. Not, not like a lot of us, we have a little, yeah. we have well, a little disposable income, which is why we don't drop dead at the price of one of them. Well, well, someone <laughs> should have. I can tell you, you know, a sophomore electrical engineering student isn't going to run out. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, 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 go ahead. Yeah, if your uh, attenuator doesn't provide enough attenuation, you know, the built in attenuator, I mean, it, it, there, there's no way you can really modify. I, I don't think that's an issue. They almost, in the old days, were 10, 20, 10 and 20, adding up to 30, or they're up to 18, more than 18 is really unusual. So don't worry about that. That's not a problem. All right, we got a next guy coming up hey, here. Rob, so yeah. I want to make a comment about yep. Contest University. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's an incredible thing, but I think that Tim kind of should he should have named it another name <laughs> because it's not just 
for context. No, 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 no. You will learn more about everything. I mean, they've got the cream of the crop there coming in to help us with antennas and setups and AC power and uh, what's good, what's bad. I, I think it's an incredible thing. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't been there, go. Uh, I yeah. really think it's an advantageous thing for all of us. <laughs> but the thing is, it's not just for contesters. So it's something you'll really learn a lot. We had 330 to 350 there last year. I don't know how he keeps squeezing in more, more <laughs> chairs. Well, there was a, probably a, a dozen, prof they call them professors, uh, to give a presentation. That was my 12th year in a row talking at Contest University. So it, uh, it t decided to go to Dayton, if nothing else, to go to Contest University. It's tremendous. And have a great pizza party. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Mr. Microphone Man? Yeah,